Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast presented by the American Society of Civil Engineers entitled Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics. To submit a question or comment at any time during the webcast, please click on the Ask a Question button at the bottom of your screen. Simply type your message into the box and click on the Submit button. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Guillermo Diaz-Fenaf. Diaz Sir, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics 2017 Live Streaming Web Conference. My name is Guillermo diaz Fanas. I'm a geotechnical engineer with WSP, and it is my pleasure to be your moderator and organizer for this seminar. We would like to thank our GOAT sponsor, Hayward Baker. Hayward Baker is North America's leader in geotechnical solutions. With a network of local offices across North America, each with direct access to the largest geotechnical knowledge base in the industry, Hayward Baker is ready to respond with the optimal solution, wherever the location, whatever the size, whenever required. Solutions include foundation support, settlement control, crown improvement, soil stabilization, underpinning, excavation shoring, earth retention, seismic liquefaction mitigation, ground water control, and environmental remediation. Hayward Baker is part of the Connected Companies of Keller, a multinational organization providing geotechnical construction solutions throughout the world. Thank you, Hayward Baker. Today, we are here for our first Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics webinar. You are very familiar with the program already, so I will go ahead and present our first speaker. Professor Tarek Abdoun is the Thomas Yovino Chair Professor and Director of the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute Ge Geocentrifuge Center. He received several awards from professional societies, including the American Society of Civil Engineers, Walter Huber Civil Engineering Excellence in Research Prize, and the U.S. Commander's Award and Medal for Public Service. He is also a recipient of several educational society awards, including the ASEE North Region Outstanding Teaching Award. He authored over 200 technical publications. His interests in research cover geotechnical engineering, advanced field monitoring, centrifuge and fuel scale testing, soil structure interaction, soil dynamics, and earthquake engineering. Satellite-based NSAR remote sensing, hurricane loading, and also offshore systems. It is my pleasure to present Professor Tarek Abdul with his very interesting topic, the effect of seismic pre-shaking history on the liquefaction resistance of granular soil deposits. Thank you very much, Guillermo, for this kind introduction. Uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody, depending on which zone you are, time zone you're in. Um, today, my presentation will talk about effect of seismic pre-shaking history on the fraction resistance of granular soil deposits. Um, liquefaction is a natural hazard which we struggle with for a long time as engineers. It continues to uh, be a challenge for our uh, design. Uh, typically, in the current practice, uh, we depend on what we call uh, liquefaction design chart uh, to do our uh, assessment of the uh, liquefaction risk. Uh, this chart is shown here uh, typically are empirical based uh, charts which are really based on previous observations. Um, typically, if you are not familiar with this chart, uh, it really looks at the soil uh, behavior or profile uh, based on CPT measurements or shear wave velocity measurements, compare that with the earthquake magnitude or uh, strength, which is the y-axis, which we, we usually refer to as cyclic stress ratio or cyclic resistance ratio. Uh, it's based on a uh, number of sites and observation of hundreds of uh, previous earthquakes, um, and they pass a line uh, between what liquefied and didn't liquefy, which is a solid line, there are different methods, different people have approached trying to predict what was the uh, most accurate line. This has been very reliable and based or uh, in use for our practice. People depend on it a lot. 
But the problem with this chart is there is some uncertainty. If you look closely to some of the chart, we have what is called false positives, which basically, based on this measurement, uh, before we get into the false uh, positives, if you are above the line, then the, your site is going to liquefy. If you're below the line, your site is not going to liquefy. Uh, we usually refer to solid symbols as sites which have liquefied and they fall above the line, so that's correct. Uh, some other which are symbols which are hollow is basically sites which didn't liquefy. Some of these hollow symbols that you see on the left of the slide are above the line and they didn't liquefy, and that's what we call false positive. The problem with this false positive is really give some uncertainty of the location of this line. And Historically, researchers and practitioners have tried to look at uh, if these lines need to be shifted and so on. So it really calls for a closer look on why this site didn't liquefy in spite they fall above the line. Uh, we spent some time looking into this curve, try to assess it to give some credibility of this chart. And it's one thing which we noticed is that most of this um, what we call false positive, comes from an area in California which is the Imperial Valley. That Imperial Valley in California is known for seeing or uh, being subjected to significant amount of shaking over the history time. So it really looks like that the history of the site plays a role on how this resistance liquefaction exists in once from one differs from one site to another. So we start looking into dividing this point now to what we call uncompacted, which is basically recent fills. We didn't see a lot of shaking before. And compacted fills or natural deposits, which have been there for a long time and see a lot of shaking. And by doing that, we replotted the same liquefaction chart, but now we divide the point, as I said, in two points, uh, two groups. The one on the left, which is the uncompacted fills, uh, and then the one on the right, which is the natural soils or compacted fills, which see a lot of history of shaking. And it comes very clearly from this step that the problem we have with false positive is really falls in the compacted fills, which has a history of pre-shaking before. So that was kind of a good indication that really the history of the pre-shaking has an effect, and we started wanted to look what kind of effect do we have. Uh, one which is uncompacted on the left, as I said, it seems there is no force positive on the line the estimated for separating liquefaction from non-liquefaction is uh, appropriately placed. So we set a series of tests or a program to look into uh, that uh, behavior of the pre-shaking or the history of shaking at the site. Uh, we used three different uh, types of techniques to do our analysis. Uh, one, using centrifuge testing, where we do a lot of tests and we may be subjected to a series of shakes and see the, how the liquefaction resistance or development uh, develop with time. Uh, we did also full-scale testing at the University of Buffalo uh, as their full-scale shaking capabilities with uh, their uh, container, which is about uh, 18 feet long. Uh, and also, it's always important to compare to reality, which is the field data. So we focus on some well-known case histories in the Imperial Valley area to kind of compare and see if we are getting the same behavior from there. So we started by looking at the history of shaking at some of the points which we refer to as false positive, which is coming from wildlife site. And in that site, it seems to be that they got a lot of shaking. Uh, we divide these types of shaking in two types, uh, one which we call here uh, event uh, A, which is the top, which is like five cycles of shaking, and that's kind of the small shaking events which happen frequently. And type B, which is event B, which is about 10 cycles of moderate shaking. And we looked at the ratio between both historic and wildlife sites, which we are trying to mimic. You get about 10 of the event A, and then you get one of the event B. So every 10 event A, you get one event B. Uh, we built our uh, soil model on the top of the, on the left of the slide, uh, have it 
accelerometers for pressure to kind of monitor the, the behavior during shaking. We also had bender elements to measure the shear wave velocity. It's very important to link the research with what practitioners typically use, like shear wave velocity, CPT, and so on, to compare the behavior of both and be able to plot things on the design chart. So we went ahead and did a series of tests looking at the impact of the pre-shaking. Uh, so what you look at here, the top uh, plot or chart, it really shows the number of shaking. So we did from one to about 60 shakes. Uh, event B are the blue uh, vertical lines. Event A are the uh, uh, black vertical lines. And you can see one, we do one event of B, then 10 of A. And always we wait between events to make sure uh, liquefaction have dissipated and wait long enough before we do uh, a follow-up. The y-axis is what we typically use in the field for the, this uh, design chart with the uh, cyclic stress ratio, so they can get a feel uh, what the demand uh, from the, uh, each event. Uh, the plot at the bottom shows the uh, liquefaction development at each shake. And so basically, shake one, you reach about RU, which is if you have RU1, then the soil have liquefied. And as you can see, as we progress with the shaking event, uh, the potential for liquefaction for the same event decreases with time. So, for example, for event B, you have the first time you shook event B, you got full liquefaction. At the end, which is event 56, for the same amount of energy or earthquake magnitude, you got only about 0.6 RU. Uh, in other cases, shake two for event A developed about 0.8 RU. By the end of the shaking event, it developed almost nothing, about 10%. So that's, again, very good indication that the pre-shaking really have a, a significant effect on the potential of liquefaction. At the same time, we were monitoring the shear wave velocity, as I mentioned, with bender elements in it. Interesting enough that it showed no significant changes, about 10 to 15 percent change in the shear wave velocity measurement along this uh, the, uh, shaking event, which wasn't, it's not what you're hopeful, but it's expected because shear wave velocity is known to be not very sensitive to the lateral pressure in particles. Uh, but again, that's an important uh, finding because, again, it reflects why some of the charts are not sensitive to this. Uh, uh, pre-shaking uh, history. Um, if we look at the same test results in a different way, so to make it hopefully clearer, what you see at the top here is a, look, is a uh, pore water pressure, excess pore water pressure buildup. So basically, whenever you are up touching or close to the liquefaction line, then your soil have liquefied. Uh, when you are not reaching it at the same level, that means they have developed some pore pressure, but not full liquefaction. So you can see if you look at it, I'll go through a few slides quickly. If you look at the dotted red line, so basically at the beginning you had in the first event, uh, that's what you see, you have something liquefaction reaching about two or three meters depth. Uh, as you progress with the shaking, uh, now you know you, you, your line have moved or the pore pressure profile moved down. As you progress more and more, it's even more further down, and basically you're not uh, developing liquefaction or touching the liquefaction line in any of them. So it's the same result, but plotted in a different way so you can see it. So basically, that's kind of, we went back, took this data, and we go back and plot it on the liquefaction chart, which people or practitioners are familiar with. And you can see we are here plotting the first uh, five events uh, on the left, and you can see this is natural deposit, didn't see any pre-shaking. So when you plot it, the solid lines are, or the solid symbols, which is the blue and red, which all the way on the left, are all solid above the line, which is consistent with the prediction. Uh, if you look at the one on the right, uh, this is basically the events towards the end of the shaking. This is uh, from 56 to 62 shaking event. And you can see now, for the same amount of shaking, now we are getting the false positive. So this one, if you remember, we showed that their buildup of pore pressure was much less. They didn't liquefy. So in spite of that, uh, you still have the same shaking energy, 
they have developed a much higher resistance to liquefaction. So this finding was observed in the centrifuge. We want to verify that we are getting the same behavior from field test or full-scale testing. So we went back and started looking at some cases which are specific uh, in that area. Two of them which are very well known, one is the El Mayro case, uh, which is in wildlife site, which uh, if you can see it here, it shows a hollow triangle line which means that it was subjected to about 7.5 earthquake magnitude, but it didn't liquefy, in spite it's above the line. And another case which had the same soil profile, very comparable uh, the characters of the soil profile, uh, is the Loma Prieta in Treasure Island in San Francisco. Uh, and in that case, it got also about 7.5 uh, magnitude, and it fully liquefied. So why two cases, similar soil uh, profile, similar shaping event, but one liquefies and one didn't liquefy. So we went back and started looking at the history of the shaking for both of them. And here is the uh, history of shaking. As you can see, the gray uh, bars are representative of wildlife sites, and you can see there is a lot of events happening before reaching the one which is 7 and 7.5. There was about 60 events, uh, while in the Treasure Island there are only two events prior to having the large earthquake. And that's a very clear difference in terms of history, and that's why if you look at the liquefaction potential, uh, this is kind of summary. The uh, Treasure Island, uh, the wildlife site didn't liquefy, which is El Miro, uh, because it has a lot of preaching, so it has a higher resistance, while Loma Prieta uh, did liquefy. So this is again confirms the observation we have been seeing in the centrifuge or in the experimental testing. If we go back and look at them, so basically if we go with the same thing we started with, so really uh, Loma Prieta l belongs more to the uncompacted field because it didn't get too much of shaking before and if you plot it there it gets the right uh, liquefaction. In the other case it's really more into the uh, natural soil deposit as a compacted fill, and in it you can see if we look at this as an indication, it's very clear that the resistance for the uh, natural deposit or compacted fill is much higher, and based on this, we were recommending uh, or observed that uh, for natural sand in Imperial Valley, because this is site-specific, has twice the resistance to liquefaction uh, of an uncompacted natural fill. So that's one observation, which I, I will continue building on it. So the question is, does always the shaking tend to improve your soil behavior, or it can change depending on the type of shaking? So we want to look at, okay, we are talking about moderate to uh, small shaking, what happens with strong shaking. So we went back, repeated some of our tests, but in this, this time we added two large shaking events to see how that would impact the increase or the uh, soil liquefaction resistance. Um, and then if we look at the profile buildup of pore pressure, we look at both events A and B again. The new event is C, which is the red one. So if we look at what happens, we start with event A, uh, and again, you start with the solid dotted red line. You can see you had relatively built up of liquefaction, about one and a half meter have liquefied. Uh, as you continue shaking, it goes down to almost no liquefaction uh, development. If you subject it to a large shaking and then do event A again, again you can see the pore pressure build up, uh, grows back again, and becomes more substantial again. So that's uh, one of them. We looked again, the same thing, but now for event B, uh, which is the blue line, again starts with high liquefaction potential, you continue shaking, it goes down, a large event kind of reset it back. It's okay. So it looks like very large events seem to reset the system. Uh, so that's something we have to keep in mind, that's why it's very important to look at the geology or the history of the site before design, deciding which way uh, you expect the pre-shaking to behave. Um, Another challenge which we are concerned about significantly uh, is the fact that shear wave velocity is not 
very sensitive to that uh, pre-shaking history. So what about CPT? So when we did uh, the large-scale testing at University of Buffalo, uh, we looked into measuring CPT measurements uh, between each event and see if how sensitive that ends, and we did that uh, parallel with uh, the shear wave velocity measurement too. Uh, again, what you see here, this is the uh, facility at Buffalo. You can see the shaking events we did here. Uh, again, small shaking, large shaking. This is were relatively on the large end because we wanted to focus more on the uh, large events. Uh, and you can see the same behavior, even with the large event at the beginning, it takes some time for the soil to develop the strength, but with time, again, towards the end, I'm talking about the bottom plot, you can see as you progress, you get the same trend where the same events now are not developing as much as pore pressure as before. Uh, if we look at the CPT measurement, which we are very interested in assessing, because this has important practical uh, application, um, what you see here is a CPT measurement in red. That's a profile of it before any shaking. Uh, you had about 1,000 kPa tip resistance uh, maximum. Uh, you had a shear wave velocity of about 130 meters per second uh, measured in that profile. Uh, as we start our shaking event and we see the progress, uh, after a few events, about 20 or 30 events, the CPT jumped to about 5,000 kPa, while the shear wave velocity increased about 145, 148. Uh, continue shaking uh, till the end of the shaking event. Uh, CPT reached about 6,000 kPa, while the shear wave velocity is still in the range of 145, 148, which is about 10% increase, similar to what we saw in the century view uh, measurement uh, test. So it's very clear that shear wave velocity, uh, CPT, uh, is very sensitive or responsive uh, to uh, the pre-shaking impact or the change in characteristics uh, based on uh, shaking. Uh, also, the relative density have increased. It went from, I forgot to point that out, it was initially started with something like 36 or 40 percent. It ended up with about 83 percent in terms of uh, relative density. So relative density and CPT both seems to be uh, increasing uh, substantially uh, as we do the shaking. Uh, shear wave velocity wasn't really reflecting that as we go. So as a preliminary observation, CPT is much more sensitive than shear wave velocity to the increased liquefaction resistance due to, uh, due to the uh, pre-shaking. So this is, has very important practice applications, and people ask, Okay, so which one we should use um, in terms of doing our analysis? So we, as a concluding remark, we came up with some engineering recommendation or concluding thoughts, uh, which I'll go over it now, and again, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, small to moderate shaking events, as we saw, tend to increase liquefaction resistance, but strong shaking can significantly reduce uh, that liquefaction resistance which has been developed. So is it all lost? No. It's, we look at it as a two-step forward, one step backward in terms of improvement. So a lot of pre-shaking uh, increases the resistance. A strong event will reset it back, but it's not completely back to normal. It's still there is significant uh, strength have been gained and very quickly will be accounted for. So it's something we need to be looked into carefully. That's why we're saying geological history of a certain site or regional charts are important in assessing uh, liquefaction behavior. We can't have one solution fits all kind of thing. Uh, then in terms of using CPT versus shear wave velocity, uh, it's always recommended that CPT and shear wave velocity provide different and complementary uh, information, so shear wave velocity is what we call a small strain behavior, so it's really related to uh, triggering of liquefaction, so it's a very important measurement. Uh, CPT provides key information, uh, it's more related to the consequences after the triggering. So one shows you or reflects more the soil behavior which controls the triggering, one shows you how much damage you'll get after. So 
CPT is relevant in that part. So best practice when possible is measure both because they give you two sides of the same kind, which is important to have. Um, for if you need to pick one, which I don't know why, but let's say assume you do. So for silty sands with known geological history, uh, we recommend something like shear wave velocity because you can avoid science content correction. Uh, and also, it, as I said, shear wave velocity is related to triggering more than uh, consequences. And we are focusing on triggering here. Uh, for old or natural compacted fields, again, with known history, um, use regional CPT or shear wave velocity. And again, I emphasize on regional, which basically known the history of the site. Um, and if you have a lot of silts, give preference to shear wave velocity. CPT uh, needs some correction factors, which has a lot of uncertainty in it. So shear wave velocity doesn't require that for this, so it gives it some advantage from that point of view. Uh, if you know nothing about both sides or of that side, then as we said, give preference to CPT because it will give you some, uh, it will, it's more sensitive to the history, and so it's giving you some indication of what the past history of that site and how it behaves. Uh, finally, before I conclude, I would like to thank uh, my co-authors and colleagues in this research. This is a long-term research uh, effort. It has a contribution for uh, other colleagues like Professor Dobri, Dr. El Sakali, uh, Jamie Seidel, uh, Teva, and Dr. Zigat. Um, with this, thank you very much for listening, and um, please, any questions? Okay, I think that we should move to the next presentation and maybe the questions uh, we can um, maybe respond. This only, only this one that, uh, that we have only time for one question. The question is, how do the CPT-based uh, shear wave velocity estimates compare to the shear wave velocity measured in the Bender elements, using Bender elements? Uh, I think that question was placed at the beginning of the presentation. We showed that in the uh, final slide, so I, I, I think that was before I showed the result from the full scale. Um, as I said, the shear wave velocity showed in both cases, centrifuge or full scale, about a change of 10%, while the CPT showed a change about 500 to 600%. So uh, it's significantly different uh, between both. CPT is much more sensitive. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a couple more questions, but we have to proceed to the next presentation. Maybe we can address them um, after the, if we have some time at the end. Uh, it is my pleasure now to present um, Todd Lohr. He is a senior geological engineering specialist with the United States Army Corps of Engineers Risk Management Center located in Denver, Colorado. He is a technical advisor for Dan and Levy safety evaluations and risk assessments, issue evaluation studies, and dam safety modification studies. He reviews and develops geological and geotechnical aspects of engineering assessment reports, design documents, and observes critical activities during construction to facilitate risk reduction throughout the Army Corps of the United States portfolio for dams and levees. Todd has over 20 years of experience in both the private and the public sector and has worked on a range of projects involving geologic, geotechnical, and foundation engineering for dams and tunnels, mining infrastructure, tailing dams, hydrogeologic assessment, and water resources projects within the United States and internationally. It is my pleasure to introduce that lawyer with his presentation, Qualitative Foundation Rock Wedge Stability Evaluation Performed for Green Peter Dam in Oregon. Okay, uh, thank you. Can I ask if I can, uh, am I being heard? Am I there? Yes, yes you're, you're live. Okay, good, very good. Just wanted to double check. All right, thank you. Uh, appreciate the opportunity to be able to participate in this. This is, I think, a little bit of a different type of evaluation regarding uh, seismic hazard assessments. 
Um, this project is located up in, oh, hold on, I'm getting handle here, make sure it goes. <laughs> okay, we're looking at Green Peter Dam, which is located up in central northeast Oregon. This is a project that was designed in 1956 through 63 and constructed in 63 to 67. And this was an era of active Army Corps dam building activities in the Pacific Northwest. And what that means is, is there's many projects being built in this region at that time. So the, the project engineers and geologists had a lot of experience. They documented everything really well. So we were really fortunate to have access to a lot of historical um, well, well preserved, um, detailed data. This is also a time during active district division and headquarter involvement and support, which which means there's a lot of communication that we we had access to, and that's that's important for doing uh, risk assessments for for dams and levees to be able to have access to such good uh, historical records and documents. All right, so there we go. It's moving quite slow here. Okay, so. Green Peter Dam is a concrete gravity dam, 380 feet high, about 1,500 feet long. It's got 26 monoliths from left to right and a crest width of 20 feet. Generates about 80 megawatts uh, from a powerhouse located in the central part of the, of the layout. And it's got uh, two main tanner gates for its spillway. Um, looking at the next slide here, Okay, there it goes. Okay, so if you can see in the central portion of, of this image, there's concrete drifts 1 through 7, concrete drifts ten, 7 through 10, and then over on the left abutment, we're looking, looking down in plan view here, uh, the K1 and K2, and then there's M1 and M2. So during construction, the designers and uh, field personnel noted that there was there was horizontal shear zones within the foundation, and they needed to find a way to access and remove portions of those shears. So these concrete drifts will be important as we go later into the presentation. So I'm just noting here that the drifts in monoliths 10 and 11 are oriented parallel to the dam crest. The concrete drifts in monoliths 22 and then 25 and 26 are oriented upstream and downstream. Here we go next. This is not, it's going very slow. Okay, this slide is showing an upstream downstream section in that upper image, and we have a grout curtain at the heel, and then a double drain line uh, underneath the main footprint of the dam. The second drain line, and the, the downstream drain line extends up the abutments in, in galleries. So if we look at the regional uh, seismic setting, we're up in the Pacific Northwest. So we have a subduction environment where the Juan de Fuca plate is being thrust down and underneath the North American plate. And we have three seismic sources that we are evaluating the entire structure from. Um, you're looking at the mega thrust the interface earthquake, the deeper ductile inner slab earthquakes, and then we have the crustal type faults. And so these are generating ground accelerations at the project site that are on the order of 0.4 to 0.5. We've just implemented a regional uh, PSHA, a seismic hazard assessment for the entire Willamette Valley, and um, we'll be having some more updated results from the, from the ground shaking there. But the entire facility is being evaluated structurally and geotechnically for, for these ground accelerations. Okay, so regional geology, we're sitting on um, the Western Cascades with the volcanic sources to the east. So we're sitting on a layered sequence of andesite and basalt and then some tertiary lava, tertiary, uh, lava flows and also sedimentary deposits and volcanoclastic type deposits. At the dam site, what we have is um, individual flow lobes that compose uh, the entire foundation of both abutments. So we're looking at a photo on the top and a diagram on the bottom. And as we toggle through these, we'll see the little sections of these, um, of these flows. Okay, so 
the interior core of a, of a lava flow will consist of basalt or, or andesitic. Um, andesitic, the, the main body of the flow, it's usually really intact, relatively intact. It has high strengths. Um, there are a lot of subvertical cooling joints within that interior part of the flow. Then surrounding it is uh, the, 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 the rubble, the breccia that, that formed as it cooled really quickly and uh, rubbleized, and then it rewelded itself. So you have the breccia zones that surround the interior. And then between these flow lobe uh, episodes, there would be volcanic uh, ash deposits. There would be tuff and airfall that would accumulate below and on top of each of these flows. And then the next sequence would override that, that diagram that we have down on the bottom. So it's the lapilli tufts that are on top and on the bottom of each of these flow lobes that have degraded due to hydrothermal activity and weathering. And they were documented in construction as being clay material, having um, having the CH type consistency with uh, gravel and angular rock fragments kind of embedded in between those flow lobes. So if we look at a generalized cross section upstream, we're looking upstream, but we have these shear zones that underlie the foundation in a number of places. Um, and these are, these are red flags in dam, and dam engineering. You don't want to be putting your, your dam on really weak, sub-horizontal type layers of clay or, or wheat material. The designers recognized this. They saw that they needed to do additional treatment and additional excavation to address these shears. The photos down below are um, in the tunnels, and they are showing those, those little shear zones, those seams that were excavated in the tunnel zone. But the designers recognized that they had uh, other issues as well. They had erosion, they had foundation instability, uh, potentially increased uplift, differential settlement. So they took extreme precautions to try to address and treat these, these, uh, these features. So we're looking now, again, at a geologic profile, a uh, geologic section looking upstream. And these gray areas, right here are where the, the designers over-excavated the foundation. Where those shears were defined to be within 20 feet of the final grade of foundation, they over-excavated and removed portions of those shears. So they left, they left bits of those shears in place where it was deeper than 20 feet. In a couple places where the loads were highest, the designers came in and added these uh, concrete drifts that we saw earlier in plan view in one of the first few slides. So they had concrete drifts um, between 9 and 10, monoliths 9 and 10 that were parallel to the dam crest. And then they had these other drifts, concrete drifts, uh, K1, K2, and M1, and M2. They were advanced into those shear zones to remove them. And those ones on the left side are, are oriented upstream, downstream. So the purpose of those was to remove portions of those shears and disrupt their continuity, increase stability, and reduce the potential for, for differential settlement and that sort of thing. However, during the risk assessment, we, we came to the assessment that, that the shears combined with other rock uh, discontinuities like rock dikes and joints and faults could form a, a wedge that would become unstable or removable during high seismic loading. This is a failure mode that really wasn't considered back in the designer's era when this dam was being constructed. Um, a lot of this concept of a removable de deformed rock wedge came from the failure at Mount in France in 1959. So we're looking back at this, these structures now and trying to assess whether or not they have this, this type of failure mode problem. To have a rock wedge, I'm going to try to blast through these quick, but uh, to have a rock wedge, we would need to have base planes, side planes, release planes that all combine to form a wedge that is able to daylight or dislodge into the top of rock surface in a downstream direction. So we have to consider the orientation of all these discontinuities, the loading vectors, uh, shear strengths of the base and the side planes, configuration of the excavation, as well as the downstream topography. So I'm 
So to, to get to that point during the initial phases of the risk assessment, we go through all of our records and we pull out everything we can, notes, foundation mapping, photos, we compile all of this together and we try to make our own conclusion and assessment as to whether or not we have uh, a configuration that's adverse with respect to uh, rock wedge or foundation stability issues. Um, these photos, I know they were not very good resolution, um, and it's showing the, the detailed mapping of the foundation along with some of the images from construction. Um, so those are mostly just to show the process of how we develop this concept of where and how these wedges may or may not form in the foundation. We also construct a paper model from all the foundation mapping and compile photos on top of the paper paper space model. The paper space model is nice. You can visually see from the from the fracture mapping and the joint mapping where and how these joints may or may not be present that could have or form a rock wedge. So then we go to our foundation plan. The yellow blocks are, are rock walls. So the, the foundation was not flat. It has a lot of vertical portions to it. So the yellow showing us the walls. We have three main joint sets that define the rock mass in this area. Here are the J1. J2 is a relief plane it's parallel to the dam orientation. J1 is oriented in toward, you know, oblique to the valley. J3 is also oriented oblique to the valley. So we have to consider how does a rock wedge sitting on a flat shear surface, how does it have to dislodge? You have to free it from its from its from the from the foundation along some other kind of discontinuity. So these side planes, the ones in orange and purple, became very important when we start looking at how does this block become removable. So we have to understand something about trace lengths, spacing, orientation. Um, we do all this with stereographic type projections and analysis, which are shown in these slides. The bottom line from these slides is really that the continuity of the joint set based on the mapping indicates that horizontally we maybe have 50 foot max length, typical length, and then about less than 25 feet in vertical length. So we have some limitations in the continuity of those rock joints that form that side, those side plane surfaces, which helps us when we start to try to put together the concept of how this how this structure moves and what sort of strength and resistance it's, it's going to have. If we look at the rock block on the right abutment, you can see how these purple bits all kind of move out. That's conceptually how that rock block would, would fail in the, in the right abutment. In the left abutment, we did the same thing. So to conceptually express that, we can, we can put those, rock, those purple rock wedges into motion and see how they have to slide out. Mm -hmm. And the note, the, mo the most important note here is that to, to free those wedges on the existing discontinuities, they have to move inward into the valley. And in fact, the left abutment block needs to move uphill, up dip on that, on one of those surfaces about five degrees. So now we know something about how those blocks might move or form or pop out of the foundation. And we can put that into plan view and conceptually see that the direction of failure for rock blocks is a little different than for how the dam loading, which is directly downstream. So if we have directly downstream loading and we have to move those blocks inward, then we get some, we get some locking and we get some forces on the abutments that might, or on the, the rock wedge side planes that might help us. The other really important part that needs to be figured out if you're doing a study like this first is understanding what's, what's the top of rock topography look like. So this is a busy figure, but we have um, the original top of rock topography that was developed from uh, boreholes and other excavations around the project site. I tried to, it's too, too busy to look at, so I highlighted the 50 foot contours off of that, off of that form. And what we do see is that there's there's ridges, rock ridges, that form directly downstream of the monolith 5, 6, and 10, 11. You can see the yellow arrows. Those are, that's a ridge, so the rock mass increases downstream. Um, same downstream of monolith 26, there's a bit of a ridge, and then further downstream in, on the left abutment, there's a larger ridge. 
So what that does is it, push, it pushes the flat line shear plane further downstream and increases the rock block in those areas. Meanwhile, here's the swales, the drainage swales or, or drainage reentrance based on the top rock topography. We can see downstream of 22 and 23 and 24, there's like a there's a lack of rock mass. The rock mass actually is is decreases immediately downstream of those those uh, monoliths, and that's 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 where you could get a projection of that base plane a lot closer to the toe, and therefore a smaller rock block, which which is something we need to consider when we do this assessment. So this slide is showing us the areas that we think that we have you know a, a larger rock mass downstream of the monoliths versus the next slide which shows us maybe we have to look a little bit harder at these monoliths um, at 22, 23, and 24 where we have a lack of rock mass sitting downstream of the dam. All right, let's see how fast I can get through these. So we have limited continuity, uh, vertical and horizontal continuity of the, the joint sets that form those side planes for those wedges. The orientation of those planes results, it has to result in an outward stepping using multiple joint sets to form a, a side plane on the order of 1 to 200 feet that we need under the foundation. This is going to form a very rock, rough, rocky, blocky surface. It's going to require rupture through portions of intact and strong rock. Then we also have... Uh, we have base planes that are 30 to 45 feet below the, the ground surface. That's, that, that, that means that our, our rock mass is, is significant sitting over on top of that. Uh, the orientation of the side planes also ends up with a, with a normal force that's 34 to 55% of the driving force will be imparted under those side planes. So that's going to increase the block stability during um, during seismic shaking event. The wedge, wedge movement is oriented into the valley, uh, 20 to 34 degrees uh, from the direction of loading. So, so we're getting a lot of interlocking and, and jump geometry that's going to kind of lock that block up just because those side planes do not seem to be continuous or weak. There's going to be a lot of strength generated in those side planes. So there's going to be dilation and rupture through intact rock that we have to account for. So if we also look really quick at the base plane, the shear plane that we're worried about, the clay, clay lapilli shut tough shears, these also tend to be fairly anastomosing. Um, they're, they have high amplitude asymmetry on the order of you know, 10 to 5 to 10 vertical feet over 25 feet. So just over the foundation footprint, we're going to have a lot of um, in situ sort of roughness that are associated with those shear planes. Um, then we also need to look at the uplift pressure. The uplift pressures at Green Peter Dam are very favorable for this scenario because we have the two drain lines. We've got the one at the heel and the one uh, mid mid footprint. Um, all the uplift data and cell uplift cell data that we've been able to compile indicates that we have up, upwards of 80% of rock mass and drain efficiency. So even at the upstream line of drains, we've got a significant reduction in water pressure where we end up with about uh, 45 to 80 feet of waterhead at the upstream end of those rock wedges. As you go to the toe of the dam, we're dry. So the, the water level drops below the wedge base planes in a lot of scenarios. And uh, we don't have the uplift pressures that we, don't, that we think we would need to really dislodge this structure. All right, some of the other considerations are that the designers were very experienced and concerned about these features. They took a lot of precautions and considered considered considerations in their design and, and construction. The concrete backfill reinforces that and that those shear planes and it disrupts their continuity. That means that to shear through those those tunnels, those concrete backfill tunnels, you have to go up and around them, through them, somehow engage the concrete and and the rock mass around those concrete um, backfill tunnels. 
And then we also had high quality foundation mapping. And, and, and this to me is a really important part of this project. I don't think you can do this type of assessment without having confidence in the foundation mapping and the details collected from the field personnel. Um, Dick Goodman and a number of others at the Bureau of Reclamation have done a lot of studies over the years where they have looked at the sliding stability of monoliths at Folsom Dam and the uh, three-dimensionality of the dam foundation system. And what they have found is that you can generate huge, huge amount of, of additional shear strength because of the rotation, torsion, dilation, the interlocking that happens between the concrete monolith within the foundation rock wedge, along the foundation contact, and in three dimensions for a concrete structure, you've got to be able to account for some of that somehow. So, so we've got to we've got to respect the 2D results. I see that I'm almost out of time. I have one more slide. We've got to respect the 2D structural analysis results, but consider the three-dimensionality of the system and contributing additional strength. So it's really important to do this type of qualitative assessment before we jump into you know, 2D numerical models. OK, last slide. This is our plan moving forward and our, our conclusions and results. We, we definitely do see that we have rock wedges that can form in the dam foundation. Um, the level of effort that we've completed that's been presented here, which is more of a qualitative three-dimensional assessment, that's probably not sufficient to inform our risk analysis process. We need to put some numbers. We need, we need to understand what the real numerical value is of, of foundation stability. So we're moving forward not just with this failure mode, but a number of others in looking at the three-dimensionality and coming up with a way to do an analysis um, of it. So we're going we're gonna to build 3D model for visualization and communication. But we're also going to do an uncoupled stability analysis using limit equilibrium uh, program called RIGID, written by Greg Scott at the Bureau of Reclamation. And then we'll also use some stereographic methods with a vector analysis and, and block, key block theory analysis. And that's, that's where we are now. We're moving forward on this. The uh, assessment is that we are we are we have a stable condition, but we um, we need to prove it out and quantify it in terms of a risk assessment. Sorry for running over a little bit. Apologize. Thank you so much, Todd. Um, I think the questions will be addressed um, uh, following uh, the meeting. Let's continue so that we can keep uh, with the timing as we go. Um, so now it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Olga John Nibu. Uh, she is a senior lecturer in geotechnical geotechnics at the University of Greenwich in the United Kingdom. Since 2010, she has worked as researcher with the Pacific Engineering Research Center at UC Berkeley, the German Research Center for Geosciences, the Institute of Earth Sciences in Grenoble, and the French Institute for Radio Protection and Nuclear Safety. Her research in engineering seismology focuses on the effect of local site conditions on ground motion, including site-specific attenuation at high frequencies, kappa, site amplification, and ground motion variability. She has co-authored 16 journal articles and participated in ground motion projects for the nuclear sector in the U.S. and Switzerland. It is my pleasure to introduce Olga with her presentation, Effects of Past Earthquakes on Liquefaction Resistance of Silty Sand, demonstrated by, uh, I'm sorry, that was the wrong title, it's an empirical alternative for hard rock ground motion adjustment, potential impact on current practice. Her presentation co-authored with uh, Dr. Groma Brahamson. Um, hello, thanks Guillermo for the introduction and thanks for the invitation to participate. So good morning, afternoon or even evening if you're uh, here in Greece like I am. Um, so uh, our case study is dealing with estimating um, ground motion on hard rock. And we'll be introducing an empirical alternative uh, with respect to the currently used um, theoretical approaches in practice. 
which I'm a bit better prepared for than uh, liquefaction. <laughs> so uh, you all of you probably pretty well acquainted with that response. So in its classical sense, we typically think uh, in terms of soil amplification, that can be related uh, to impedance contrasts in the OMD sense. I can get a little more complex when it comes to actual discontinuities, basins, topographic relief, etc. Um, you can have uh, side effects in terms of nonlinearity of the soil, etc., and the strong shaking. Most of these phenomena will typically affect uh, lowish frequencies. And uh, nowadays, you probably have quite a few tools on your computers in order to estimate um, these types of uh, phenomena in terms of site response. So the standard geotechnical approach, uh, we're used to going typically from uh, rock uh, input motion at rock level up to the soil profile to the top of the soil. So what we'll be looking at uh, in this case study is kind of the inverse. So we'll be going from soft rock to hard rock. The reason is Typically, if we need to estimate ground motion in hard rock, uh, we normally use uh, models called uh, GMP, so ground motion prediction equations. They're developed uh, from empirical data, but the thing is most of our stations are not located on hard rock, they're mostly located on salts and soft rock. So when we use a published uh, GMP model, uh, there's an implicit an implicit conversion uh, when we need to go from soft rock, soft rock to actually predict ground motion and hard rock. So our study is kind of examining uh, that implicit conversion there. So when we're thinking of uh, response of hard rocks, a lot of the time we're comparing with the response of soft rock. That's because a lot of the data is located there, so that's much better constrained based on data. So we very often look at ratios between hard rock and soft rock to deal with the response. So here you're looking at such a ratio with periods. So the blue box on the right is long periods, which would be short frequencies. So it's uh, so low frequencies, for example, lower than 10 hertz. In that case, actually, the, me the dominant mechanism behind uh, the response of hard rock is amplification. So the phenomena we looked at before in terms of the classical sense uh, of side effects uh, more closely describe what goes on for hard rock. The problem is when we get to higher frequencies or shorter periods, if you will, so frequencies perhaps above 10 hertz, then the dominant mechanism is no longer uh, the classical amplification and, or impedance contrast. It's more attenuation. And that's a whole new world, and it's much less straightforward to compute that, and we don't have uh, as many standardized tools to do that. So in case you're wondering why in the world do we care about anything above 10 hertz, so we don't really, if, if I'm building my grandma's house, I don't have to worry about high frequencies. I might if I'm dealing with nuclear power plants, uh, not uh, for the shell, but what's inside, so the safety-related equipment inside, is sensitive to ground shaking above 10 or even 20 hertz. Another case in which I would care for high frequencies is if I'm dealing with small concrete dams. So a lot of them have fundamental frequencies above 10 or even 15 hertz. So in that context, we care about high frequencies. And for those frequencies, as we said, the dominant mechanism is attenuation. And the factor we typically use to describe and quantify that is called kappa. We won't really have time to go into exactly what it is and all the ways it's measured through. But basically, if you look at the the figure at the bottom left, if you look at the, an amplitude spectrum, K 
kappa is basically the mechanism that makes the amplitude drop. So it's basically what kills your high frequencies uh, until you hit your noise floor. So if you're measuring that at a site at a certain distance from your source, and typically you'll be doing that uh, so you'll have a certain distance between your site and the source, you're going to see two components in the kappa factor. So what I've uh, color-coded in blue is basically affected by the distance from the source. So that's attenuation that comes uh, from the path. Uh, and the red bit, if you will, the residual bit, which is not related to distance, that's what comes from basically underneath your source. So from now on, when we say kappa, we're implicitly um, denoting the, the site-specific um, attenuation underneath a particular site. So what's the effect of this mysterious kappa on ground motion? Uh, in the most seismological sense, if we want to look, start by looking at Fourier spectra. So this is a Fourier spectrum. It's kind of showing you uh, the energy you have um, at each frequency. So on the left, for your low frequencies, it's dominated by the magnitude, for example, so the earthquake source. As you go towards the right of your plot at the high frequencies, then it's dominated by kappa, so high frequency attenuation. Um, a usual example is what happens if we want to convert uh, or adjust ground motion from soft rock to hard rock, for example, we're going to be going from the red to the blue. So say from California, soft rock, which typically has a kappa of around 40 milliseconds, to central U.S. hard rock, which typically in the literature has a kappa value of about 5 or 6 milliseconds. So looking at the plot, you're, going, you're moving from the red to the blue line. And if you look at the round 10 hertz, that gives you about a factor of three of a difference depending on the kappa value you assume you have, which is a relatively large um, value probably. So that was the Fourier spectral domain. If you want to go into the response spectral domain, which is a little more tightly related to structures, of course, let's look at uh, the same shift. Uh, let's look at how it will change ground motion. So we're looking at a response spectra which are normalized by the peak ground acceleration, so PGA. Uh, and we're looking at frequency. So instead of looking at the decay, now we're focusing on the peak of the spectrum. And in the red case, we have the peak around 10 hertz. And converting soft rock to hard rock uh, through decreasing kappa, which basically means we're doing what? We're decreasing attenuation at high frequencies. That's causing our spectrum to shift to the right. So from 10, we might go up to even 40 uh, hertz. So that's basically saying we have more energy at high frequencies. That was normalized spectra. If we look at the absolute values, the shift is not only to the right, it's also upwards. So you have this inflation of high frequencies, if you will, above maybe 10 hertz, and the range is even a factor of 10. So that just gives you an idea of the, the change we assume happens in in ground motion going from a, a high attenuation soft rock like we have in California to a low attenuation very hard rock that we have, for example, in the Central Eastern U.S. Now, one recent project where this was studied, so where uh, they tried to adjust soft to hard rock motion for the central for central eastern North America was the NGAEs project a lot of you are probably aware of. So that was organized by the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Institute um, Center at UC Berkeley, PEER. So what they um, uh, assumed was they took a value for kappa equal to 6 milliseconds, which is basically the average value we get if we look at the published literature for that region. But that was not derived from site-specific data. 
So we're going to have a look at the effect of that. So basically, this project assumes that this kappa has this value and that this value is basically related to actual attenuation, so damping. Uh, how we're going to go about this is we're going to be looking at side factors. So these are basically coefficients. So there's one number for each frequency. Uh, and usually we look at the combined effect of two things, so the VS profile and kappa, which is basically your amplification from the impedance contrast and the site attenuation, like we said. So typically, these scaling factors that are used in practice, they're computed analytically, and uh, the VS effect is pretty straightforward. It's impedance, and the kappa is typically only related to damping. The reason we care is if we consider the VS and the kappa in the net effect, which is the bottom figure here, what you observe uh, is the bump on the right, so around 20, 25 hertz. That's going to give you an amplification of ground motion at high frequencies going from, say, uh, 40 to 6 milliseconds, so soft to hard rock, of up to 3.5. That's a pretty big number. The question is, are such high numbers reasonable? Because all of this is basically theoretical, and what we're going to do here in our case study is an empirical check on that. So basically, in this context, what we do is we try and grab as many records from hard rock sites as possible, and we group them together. And we look at the combined VS kappa effect on these data from hard rock with respect to soft rock, which we define at the typical value of 760 meters per second. Uh, and we compare what we see from the data uh, to what the ground motion prediction equations would give us for the 760, and as we said, they're pretty well constrained um, there. So what we need to do is we go through some data sets available worldwide, and we look at whether they have enough data for our purpose, which means data from hard rock stations, so VS above 1,500 meters per second, and short distances. The reason is, if you recall the components of kappa, we need to minimize the effect of the blue bit, which is the path attenuation, and focus on the site, which was the red bit. So quickly skimming through some data sets that are often used. So from the US, we have the NGA data sets uh, recently compiled from the East and the NGA West too. Uh, little data in the East, uh, almost not at all from the NGA West. They didn't really have very hard rock there. From Europe, you have the resource data set for the whole of Europe, and you have data sets from Switzerland. Um, BC Hydro has data sets for subduction seismicity and crustal seismicity that I need to skim through a little fast to keep on time. So this table basically gives you the number of records which are adequate for our study, so that I've highlighted in yellow, so a lot have practically nothing to work with. Uh, we need to say that this is still a lot more data than what was available when the first analytical models, which are still used today, were derived. So we will go ahead with our case study and we look at NGA East and British Columbia. So what you have in the red boxes are basically the data that we can use for this type of study. So the first take-home message was that there's uh, still a pretty big lack of data on hard rock. The second take-home message it comes from observing the shapes of the spectra. So based on the definition of kappa, what we expect to see when we look at spectra, so these are all the spectra we have for a particular site, so all the different recordings from different earthquakes. And in this case, uh, they tend to uh, the slope is downward, as we expect, because kappa is basically the damping that's killing the high frequencies. The interesting bit is that we also have uptrending spectra or flat spectra. That basically means that we have also a different uh, phenomenon um, 
adding into the dampen effect. So sometimes it can even mask the pure dampen effect, and that's broadband amplification. That's a little different to the typical resonance you can uh, imagine based on the soil over bedrock situation where you have a very clearly defined peak. This is more broadband, but it can still mean that the kappa we measure is not only due to the damping, but it's the net effect of that and the amplification. And sure enough, when we go through the motions and we compute the kappa values, uh, and we look at uh, the values, they're pretty much all over the place. So on the figure on the left, you see all the kappa values. Most of them are for sites which have a VS30 of 2,000 meters per second. That doesn't really mean, to be honest, that miraculously all the hard rock sites in the central eastern U.S. were measured and found to have a VS30 of 2,000. And it means that we're kind of behind with actually um, characterizing hard rock sites and these values were assigned to describe them. So not all of them have the same response and not all of the hard rock sites or assumed hard rock sites have the same kappa. So when you look at the histograms on the right, what you see is that the mean is around five or six milliseconds and that's actually the mean, as we said, of kappa when it comes from the literature. But there's a really big scatter indicated by this red arrow and that shows that a lot of the sites with the big values are the sites with a downtrending spectra where you mostly have the dampen effect, but you have as many sites on the bottom with the negative kappas, and those are the uptrending spectra where you have, if you will, the contamination from the amplification. So it's these two mechanisms in play again, and the reason we care is that they affect the way we compute the side factors. So when we want to compute ground motion and hard rock, this is the type of side factors or coefficients that we use compared to soft rock. So we derive them analytically. It's been the, the typical way to do this in practice um, for the last 20 years. And you can, these are just examples. You can do it with a point source stochastic model. You can do it with the inverse random vibration theory approach. Uh, the point is, either way, you get this bump above 10 hertz where you get amplification of high frequencies up to two or even three. That's the theoretical models. Now, if we look at the model, the empirical model we get from the data, uh, you don't see such a big bump on the right. So preliminary conclusions is that data on hard rock sites, the few we have, doesn't show this very strong increase at high frequencies, and the difference between analytical and empirical models is very roughly of a factor of two. So the initial conclusion from our case study is basically these two lines, the orange and the purple, come, coming from our data that we analyzed. So these are preliminary empirical models that we propose for use in practice as alternatives to the currently used theoretical or, if you will, analytical ones. So basically, this project, uh, this uh, case study, came up with these uh, suggested factors, but it's practically opened a bit of a can of worms. So there's a lot of issues jumping at us, the big uncertainties and the scatter and the data, the difficulty in separating the two mechanisms of amplification and pure damping. There's other things we don't even have the time to mention, like possible contributions uh, which are region-specific. Uh, so understanding the discrepancy between the observations and uh, the analytical models so far and evaluating the current scaling methods, uh, all of this is being looked into within the CAPA project going on uh, this year and in the next two years, funded by Peer Repri and the European Sigma 2 project. So if you watch this space, there's going to be updates about how to proceed with these uh, prickly issues in the future. But the big practical question for now is what do we do today? So in the meantime, uh, the thing to do is to basically consider this epistemic uncertainty in terms of a logic tree. So that allows you to consider the available models um, today. So approach one, which is the current paradigm, uh, the theoretical models we saw, 
that's in blue, it's going to give you your upper bound and high frequency ground motion. The empirical models we just proposed would probably give you your lower bound, so the purple line. Left you see period, on the right you see frequency. So this is a really big range between possible um, or possibly valid models. And by assigning weights to these different uh, models, you, you kind of get to deal with all of them. So there's a, a certain limitations on the empirical model which I've uh, listed here. The biggest one being the possible misclassification of hard rock sites. So taking the empirical model with a pinch of salt, that's what it means practically. And more details about the case study you can find in these two publications. So until there's more uh, recent updates from the peer EPRI Sigma project, we propose this new empirical alternative. And with that, I will thank you. And I'm open to thoughts and questions. What I can't answer now, I'll be happy to answer later or via email. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have time for one question. Um, if you would like to address anything on that, please feel free. Yes, yeah, so um, um, about weights, uh, how do we assign weights in the logic tree? So that would typically be on a consulting basis, meaning if we go back, there's weights to be assigned in all the plausible models that cu the current state of the art um, has to offer. So we can't really assign, you know, propose weights through this presentation. That is basically down to the experts, and within a project, it's done on a, an expert basis, and usually through um, a consulting basis. So thanks. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to proceed to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Cici Nicolau. Dr. Nicolau is a fellow of the American Society of Civil Engineers, is a governor-elect of the Jew Institute Board and member of the Soil Dynamics and Earthquake Engineering Committee. She is currently a principal in the Geotechnical and Tunneling Technical Excellence Center of WSP with 20 plus years of worldwide geotechnical experience with emphasis of performance-based design, soil structure interaction, and geo-risk assessment and mitigation. Dr. Nicolau has participated in reconnaissance and recovery missions after the disasters of 9-11, Hurricane Sandy, and several earthquakes. Among her awards are the Prakash Prize for Excellence in Geotechnical Engineering and the recent Principal of the Year by ACEC New York. She gives talks encouraging women to follow STEM careers and has developed fun interactive engineering programs for students and their families. Nicolau received a Civil Engineering Diploma from the National Technical uh, University of Athens in Greece and her master's in science and PhD degrees from the University at Buffalo. For me, it is a pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Cici Nicolau, with her presentation on performance and resilience as the sign basis in geotechnical earthquake engineering, a practical perspective. Thank you very much, Guillermo. Uh, it is a pleasure being with uh, all of you today on this webinar. I uh, would like to uh, start by acknowledging my collaborators from NTUA, the National Technical University of Athens, Ralis Kukulis, Fanny Gelagoti, Irene Yoyu, and George Gazetas. Um, a lot of uh, the work that you will see on the case history presented here has been developed in the National Technical University of Athens. And also, I would like to acknowledge the um, Technical Excellence Center of WSP for their support, including my uh, co-author on this presentation, Dr. Monica Antonaki. So um, we have seen um, the need for moving engineering, and especially geotechnical earthquake engineering, towards resilience and performance design philosophy. It's evident from the increase of the frequency and destructiveness of extreme events. 
Uh, for example, here you can see a picture from the um, 2016 uh, Luis Mi Ecuador earthquake that will be covered by Dr. Vera after me, um, where the um, and, and some data, factual data for, from uh, the reinsurer companies for the 2016 year being called the worst in a global loss or after an extreme natural event uh, with a loss of about $160 billion, an increase of almost 70% from the year before that, primarily uh, due to lack of um, ability to, to predict uh, this series of extreme events that happened uh, during that year. Um, and what we have learned is that uh, downtime can um, uh, harm more than uh, physical damage. Um, and as you can see, there are some facts from the uh, very recent Kaikura earthquake in New Zealand where um, uh, the most of the impact, about uh, $500 million impact on the GDP alone in the first 18 months was due to interruption of business and particularly um, transportation infrastructure where the initial cost of 2 to $3 billion in the New Zealand government is attributed by $2 million only in transportation infrastructure. Um, our urban centers are the most vulnerable uh, to, um, uh, to this um, type of uh, uh, extreme event. Uh, because they rely heavily on their infrastructure and they are particularly vulnerable. Uh, for example, you see here the New York City Hurricane Sandy 2012 um, disaster caused the financial damage of more than uh, 70 billion US dollars and really we did not have much of physical damage. It was all mostly caused by uh, downtime. So downtime can cause worse loss with local and global effects. And uh, this is bad news in um, uh, um, the current society where our, our population is increasing and our infrastructure is aging while um, uh, we just received a D plus uh, grade in the latest ASE um, um, infrastructure evaluation that I would encourage you to take a look at this report. It's available on the ASE website and has a lot of um, significant uh, thoughts and um, uh, breakdown of these gradings. Uh, just um, uh, some examples from this report is that two out of five miles of urban interstates are congested and 188 million trips are taken every day across structurally deficient bridges. So often uh, society pushes us to make changes. In, this, in the major recent events, I think it is evident that we should do more than trying to work with a worst case, big one, uh, that can be a black swan that is hard to predict. And rather, we should um, try to prevent disasters, uh, prevent hazards from becoming disasters uh, by proper engineering and thinking differently. Uh, particularly, um, the society is pushing that, and that involves geotechnical engineering, that um, resiliency and sustainability need to be included in infrastructure design and retrofit. So how do we do that? Structural engineers have been working on that for many years now, and this is a framework of performance-based design, or PPD, uh, where you have different levels of earthquakes, from uh, frequent to very rare, and uh, corresponding acceptable uh, performance objectives for a structure, from uh, immediate occupancy to life safety for a rare event, to collapse prevention in the very rare event. This is from FEMA 274. And more recently, they just released uh, ASC 716 uh, guidelines uh, have um, uh, moved us uh, to, instead of a hazard objective for the ground motion as we used to have, to a collapse risk objective that is now a probability of collapse of 1% in a design life of 50 years. 
Now, these have some underlying um, assumptions for what means life safety. And you can see on the green uh, line for a normal risk category structure, like residential, if we have this maximum considered earthquake, there will be a probability of total or partial collapse of 10% of the new structures and probability of an engagement or endangerment of lives on the order of 25%, which makes us wonder, can we do better? Can we uh, move towards life safety goals and just um, uh, that, that not just life safety but also life quality. So how do we do that? Some, some tools that are available are shown on this framework where we quantify performance objectives with a 3D that are, you can see on the, the left of losses that is commonly asked by clients and researchers in terms of downtime, dollars or damage and death. Uh, to quantify this, uh, we have two factors on the left, the uh, nature, that is something we have no control over but can affect the site, and then man-made or engineered um, this environment or the environment where that uh, gives us the vulnerabilities. Combining these two, we can quantify the risk and take actions that could uh, give us priorities and short and long term conditions to achieve these goals. Now, how do we calculate these uh, 3Ds? Again, in structural engineering, there are um, uh, tools that are available. This is ATC 58. It's available. Um, for everybody to look at where we use building performance models uh, and uh, different ground motions to come up with a damage that is then associated with consequences. Here is an example of um, uh, the consequences that are represented in this framework by fragility curves that correlate something like peak ground acceleration drift uh, to all the other consequences depending on the state of damage that is quantified. Now, in geotechnical engineering, it's very hard to do something similar because we don't have parameters that are so well defined as a drift or a displacement of a floor as we have in the structures. But here is an analogy that I try to make on um, a geotechnical uh, problem where um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if this can be uh, seen properly, but. Uh, there is a, an animation, okay, that uh, you can see that for a very frequent event uh, with a sliding rule of hazard, you want to stay with a safety factor of greater than one. For a rare event, you still want to be at around a factor of safety of one, but look at the formations, and for large deformations, you need to look even at collapses and look at what are the consequences of these collapses. So in moving in geotechnical earthquake engineering, there are two things that we need to look at. One is the probabilities for the ground motion levels. That depends on the state of practice, but also the importance of the structure and other objectives. But also consider the life cycle of an existing infrastructure and the probability of its failure. And now, this um, has to be combined with the initial construction cost and the expected consequences and loss, but also maintenance and cost of the commission after work life. Um, on the left, you see some pioneering work in the 1994 guidelines for uh, societal criteria that need to be combined with all of that from the Australian Committee of Large Dams on how you would have different objectives of uh, risk levels uh, of, with respect to probability of loss of life. And all of these um, in, simple, in a simple graph uh, require uh, the um, um, require the um, combination of um, uh, understanding natural hazards and risks with the best technology we have, and also uh, using technologies like monitoring and protective systems to achieve combining both natural disaster resiliency not only for an individual geotechnical problem, but also an overall system. And what I would like to highlight is this key uh, 
points that I would like you to remember when I go through the uh, case study. Uh, collaborate, educate, think simple, learn from success, and more importantly, look at the big picture in order to achieve all that. And um, I don't know what really has happened in the big picture, but I think um, it used to be more in the picture than it is now, and maybe we should take a look at how things were looked at uh, before. And um, just to mention ATC 1978, did mention that it's really the probability of failure with resultant casualties that is of concern, rather than the geographical distribution of that probability, which is not necessarily the same as the distribution of probability of exceeding some ground motion parameter. And that's very important. Professor Andrade's 1983 uh, did say that vulnerability can be controlled even diminished when we use engineering innovation with additional cost that has to be related to the probability of loss and that interdisciplinary training is important. Finally, uh, Professor Finn in 2000 said, whatever your opinion about the probabilities and this risk analysis type of an approach, constructing an event logic tree like the one that Olga just showed um, in her presentation, forces us to think more about the process by which failure develops, and therefore it contributes to a deep understanding of the likely behavior. This is very important. Now, to demonstrate um, the benefits of an alternative approach in geotechnical earthquake engineering, we will show a study of uh, earth retaining systems uh, that targets evaluation of resiliency in some goals, uh, which are, one, to remain functional after medium intensity level earthquakes, two, preserve the structural integrity under extremely strong, unprecedented loading scenarios, and three, demonstrate a redundancy in the system itself. We looked at two uh, equivalent retaining wall systems, both of which have conventional equivalent uh, safety factors that are based on uh, strength um, uh, calculations. And we subjected those in two different levels of shaking, a low or moderate level of shaking that's to be expected within design levels, and an extreme event that is well beyond design. Here are the two systems. On the left, you see a conventional tangent pile wall system. And on the right-hand side, you see an, a mechanically stabilized earth wall system. Both have um, the same bearing and backfill properties. They both have a height of 10 meters, and the MSC wall has reinforcement at a distance of vertical distance spacing of uh, about 60 centimeters. Now, we analyzed and we designed uh, both walls so that they have the same factor of safety of 1.8 for static conditions and the same pseudo-static factor of safety of 1.2 for a, a peak ground acceleration of 0.16 G. Um, so in that sense, these two walls have the same conventional factor of safety uh, passing the factor of safety test. They are both safe to be used for the objectives that they were designed for. Now, what we wanted to look at is how they would behave under different earthquakes. And one of the key parameters is the, um, uh, the friction coefficient that the reinforcement is going to provide. Here you see the steel grid of um, a horizontal spacing of uh, 20 centimeters of each uh, grid that is on the MSC wall. And this was evaluated first by codes, uh, but also by actual pull-out experiments at the Soil Dynamics Lab of MTUA uh, using instrumentation with um, vertical and horizontal actuators and clamps uh, to simulate and calculate what the actual um, apparent friction would be. Then we used uh, several ground motions, and uh, here are some of them presented in the form of spectral acceleration for 5% damping. Um, and what I would like you to focus on is the uh, 
të ture kërës është gjilloj, anë në më prieta, të adisë përpën lajnë dhe rinaldi North Street Motion, which is an extreme motion, they have, as you can see, point 4G and point 8G as PGA, and um, they are considered the moderate and the extreme event that we tested these two systems with. So the first uh, parameter we looked at uh, was the, uh, the dynamic response of the walls that we analyzed numerically uh, was to look at the displacement at the top of the wall and you can see uh, how the two systems on the red is the conventional pine wall on the green is the MSC wall and uh, you can see at the end of the shaking of the Kilroy record uh, we have a displacement on the order of 5 to 13 cents at the top of the wall, which would be considered acceptable for uh, safety and uh, functionality. Now, when you go to the um, extreme Rinaldi record, um, you still have uh, both systems avoiding the collapse, but you have a very large deformation on the order of half a meter for the conventional wall that would make its behavior unacceptable um, after this earthquake is done. And um, with about half of that deformation, the MSC wall proved to be resilient, uh, where um, under both moderate and strong shaking, and demonstrated uh, superiority over the conventional wall. Now, furthermore, uh, to quantify the performance and uh, compare the two systems, we looked uh, first at the moment of curvature at the point of fixity that you can see on the right-hand side uh, for the conventional wall, and I will show the results for the strong ground motion um, uh, shaking. And, um, uh, what we observe there is that the pie uh, has developed very large curvature which would make um, its strength uh, eliminated, making it threateningly vulnerable to aftershocks which are very likely after such an extreme event. The uh, MSC wall on the other side was quantified uh, by looking at the axial stresses along the rib length and at the mid level, number 7, and at the bottom height, number 17, and uh, we saw as um, the, again, that the MSC wall is more resilient. Uh, we do not exceed the um, yield limit of 500 megapascals in the axial stresses on any level of reinforcement, in addition to behaving much better on the lateral top deformation as we saw. Here is a comparison between the two uh, quantifiers of performance of the two walls. And um, moving into the uh, last objective of redundancy, we wanted to look at any preservation of uh, strength in the system. So what we did is we removed half of the reinforcement of the MSC wall and we made the spacing, vertical spacing of, of 1.2 meters instead of 60 centimeters. And we we simulated the strong motion again in our numerical model, and what we saw is that um, something surprising. The world seemed to behave the same, and we could not understand why. Uh, in that graph, you can see the same levels of deformation along the height of each wall, whether or not you have dense or have the reinforcement. So what we did is we looked closely at the system behavior and realized there is a plastic and a strain difference that transforms the resistance mechanism of the whole system and that in the uh, weaker uh, half reinforcement case we have um, a bigger plastic chains in the plastic chain contours graph that you see over here and I transfer more on the load of um, to the reinforcement but also to the soil. So, um, and they, they both made it, which proved that um, this system does have a balance. And in summarizing this example, um, both systems, conventional and MSC wall, may avoid collapse, but the time wall deformation would be unacceptable under extreme events. The MSC wall is more redundant. And a numerical analysis review of the results and understanding provides valuable insight in the behavior of the systems. Now, the proof 
is on case studies. Uh, most of the uh, systems of the MSC walls uh, do not typically fail in uh, earthquakes as we have seen in the data from the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. So in closing, uh, what are our challenges moving towards a new frontiers moving performance or resilience based um, uh, geotechnical earthquake engineering? Here are some of them. Measuring resilience going beyond factor of safety to uh, define performance objectives. Uh, create predictive damage and loss models. Incorporate uncertainties, both in the properties and on the earthquake itself. Accounting for multiple hazards and their often cascading effects. And incorporating life quality into life safety. In long-term goals, a resiliency approach would ideally combine geotechnical, structural, and system risk assessments with innovative technologies and socioeconomic needs and consequences of these events to provide tailored solutions in an integrated platform to manage, to manage and mitigate risks. So the ball is in our court. Uh, we need to expect the unexpected things, the unthinkable. And going into the bullet points, I will run through um, a few seconds of slides to uh, remind everybody how important it is to collaborate with each other. We often don't speak the same language. This is a clear picture from an earthquake in 2014 of myself and a structural engineer, Ramon Gilson. Uh, I'm fascinated by the port failure, and uh, Ramon maybe not so much. He was looking at something else, probably something structural. Uh, we need to think multi-hazards and um, oftentimes raising um, houses for um, being resistant to uh, the next flood level makes them extremely weak in earthquakes, like the example of this house that would not behave very well if an earthquake would happen with this weak story. And of course, the importance of proper geotechnical investigation and uh, review of the geologic history. Here's an example of in Chichi where this bridge was very well structurally designed, but the geotechnical technical uh, investigation was overlooked that the fault was running through it. Finally, looking at successes rather than failures and understanding what works and doesn't work is very important. Uh, here is a picture from the Turkey earthquake where uh, modern reinforced concrete structures failed, but this old masonry lean structure remained. Um, I'm not sure why. And finally, do not be afraid and we need um, especially young minds to think out of the box and incorporate factors of robustness and redundancy in achieving resiliency. And just um, to remind all of us that stronger is not always better in the case of geotechnical earthquake engineering or earthquake engineering in general. And with that, I thank you very much. And um, uh, maybe we can have one question. Um, uh, so there is a, uh, a question from uh, uh, Ashley Morales on uh, could you make the MSC wall even more economical and eliminate other enforcement based on what you showed as an example? So that is um, a really no. Um, uh, we were surprised at first sight by this excellent response of both systems. Uh, but we're looking at in detail at the numerical um, result and the contours that we looked at. In the first case, we had a rigid block um, response that was um, uh, due to the heavy reinforcement. And now the system, in, when we removed most of the reinforcement, um, it sustained severe plastic yielding, not only the, by the stress of the reinforcement, Bars, but also internally into the soil. Um, so when the bars are structurally underexploited, which means they offer resistance only by friction, uh, while the internal soil develops no serious strain, is the first case where we would like to be. And in this extreme event, it is great to have the redundancy of uh, engaging also the soil, but and the very heavy, especially on the bottom stress bar, and it shows that this system has reached its capacity and it's obviously a sign of um, eminent failure. 
Uh, so no, I would not remove the reinforcement. Okay, so um, if there's any question, we're going to address them uh, individually. Uh, we're going to proceed to our next presentation. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Javier Vera Gonaver. Um, Dr. Javier Vera uh, earned an undergraduate uh, degree in civil engineering at the Catholic University of Santiago de Guayaquil in Ecuador. Uh, his master's degree from the National University of Mexico and his PhD in geotechnical engineering at UC Berkeley in California. Um, he has over 21 years of professional experience in the field of civil engineering. He has worked on various engineering projects, um, including civil, petrochemical, offshore, and port projects in Ecuador, USA, Mexico, and Peru. He is currently the director of engineering uh, institute at the UCSG and also a CEO of his uh, firm Geo Studios in Ecuador. He was a member of the Committee of the Ecuadorian Construction Norm and also led author of the Geotechnical and Foundations chapter and co-author of the Seismic Hazards and Earthquake Resistant Design chapter, officially presented in 2014. Dr. Vera Granaler obtained the Diplomat Certificate in Geotechnical Engineering from the Academy of Geoprofessionals, ASC, in 2016. With this, it is my pleasure to introduce you uh, to his presentation, Case History, Liquefaction, um, damage on gravelly sands and silty sand deposits at Nanta Port after the 7.8 Ecuador 2016 earthquake. Thank you very much, Guillermo. Uh, uh, I would like to present this uh, case history as uh, a very important information to the data from uh, uh, gravel deposits that actually uh, caused a lot of damage in the port of Nanta. And um, my uh, presentation is uh, uh, going to cover uh, uh, about a, uh, a little bit about uh, about the earthquake uh, that uh, we felt in uh, April 16, 2016, of magnitude 7.8 Nico uh, in South America. Then I will uh, explain about the uh, uh, damage of the uh, mass support that the first we went with the gear team and uh, ATC team that uh, uh, leading by uh, Dr. Cecil Michelaude and myself. Then we uh, came back and did uh, geotechnical characterization of the, of the site and uh, we evaluate the, the liquefaction trading base on the shear wave velocity measurements and the Chinese uh, DPT uh, test. Okay, so uh, just to uh, show what uh, Dr. Rollins showed in the Australia conference in 2016, you will see several case histories from uh, rebel liquefaction from uh, 1891 to 2016 from uh, Manta Port, uh, uh, Ecuador uh, earthquake in, with the magnitude 7.8. Uh, Ecuador is, is located, uh, sorry, uh, but too fast. Ecuador is located in South America and we have the, uh, a converge of the subduction zone of the Nazca plate to, uh, Ecuadorian continental plate or, uh, South America continental plate that is penetrating in about 66 Millimeters per year, and uh, in uh, April uh, 16, 2015, we 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 uh, experienced a major earthquake uh, with a magnitude 7.8. Uh, we saw we see in, in this plot the the ground motion records that is uh, 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 based on the gear uh, report, and we see the epicenter here. We see the east west component uh, slow motion, uh, and we are going to focus on the man support that is with the uh, green circle. Uh, we, we have there uh, an slow motion station, 
located in a site with uh, shallow soils with uh, soft rock with a BS steady of around 500 to 600 meters per second. So we did that a deconvolution all the way down to 20 meters where we found uh, a BS of uh, 900 meters per second to uh, understand the, the behavior of the, of the site at the man support and perform site response analysis. This is a very interesting plot because you will see in uh, Apex station the analysis <coughs> the the PGA uh, record went all the way to 1.4 uh, G. So uh, this is uh, man support in a Google Earth uh, image. Uh, we have uh, a breakwater uh, with uh, uh, that uh, experience uh, scientific fraction, uh, medium depth uh, sand. Uh, also, there is uh, several uh, damages in the piles due to SSI effect. Uh, so, social interaction because of the kinematic effect of the liquefying upper layer uh, sand. We have also uh, flow liquefaction with uh, lateral splitting in some areas, but we are going to focus only in the marginal wharf that is in red that uh, experience a flow liquefaction with uh, uh, loose to, to medium uh, dense uh, gravelly sand and sandy gravel uh, man-made. Uh, this uh, uh, information that uh, you can find in the year uh, report uh, from uh, Ecuador Airport, uh, we saw uh, settlements, vertical settlements from Fort 4 centimeters to 46 centimeters. This you can see from the from the left uh, figure, the marginal wharf structure supported by piles, and you see the pavement that settled, and you see the sand ejecta. Also, you see the 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 slope. Uh, you see the, the structure and move around one meter uh, laterally. And this is a cross section where we uh, find the uh, sand and silty uh, ejecta. We saw cracks uh, in the pavement, uh, settlement from 40 to 50 centimeters. <coughs> you can see from, from the figures that uh, sand ejecta, so it's a uh, sandy gravel, gravelly sandy material that ejects all the, all the sand. Uh, at the, at the full, uh, surface. Uh, so we did, uh, after that, uh, GEAR and ATC went to the, to the port of, uh, of Manta, with the GEAR studios, we went, uh, back and performed a CPT new test, SPT, she was the velocity measurements from a surface wave. And, uh, and uh, we talked with uh, Dr. Kyle uh, Rollins, and he recommend us to uh, create a, a, a GPT uh, system with uh, measuring also uh, energy with a uh, uh, route, uh, 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 instrumental route with uh, string gauges and uh, accelerometers in order to capture the energy on every uh, uh, flow. So you see uh, along the, the, the wharf, see with the white is the, uh, the upper layer is the a gravel sandy material or in some areas uh, sandy, sandy gravel, which is a, a, a man-made uh, field, let's say, uh, in order to create the port. Then you see uh, a, a color with uh, orange that is still the gravel, but uh, that, that the one that was uh, prone to liquefy because of the uh, density of the of the material, and with the uh, blue, blue line, you will see the the water table at the time of the earthquake. The earthquake uh, occurred at six six 
6 uh, p.m., uh, 7 p.m. that uh, we expect based on the on the on the wave and the uh, and the uh, and the uh, and the position of the sea level was a very low uh, uh, sea sea level uh, elevation, and that also was caused that uh, that that the soil that was prone to liquefy from from the from the from the left uh, uh, side was not able to look aside because was not uh, fully saturated or or everything was uh, one was uh, 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 a good thing. But uh, eventually, if uh, this air could, uh, would uh, could uh, happen, let's say of 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 uh, eleven a.m., uh, I think that the damage will be more uh, important. So we did some uh, pits, uh, 2.5 meters. Actually, we use particularly uh, part uh, from uh, the Catholic University of San Diego, with a pit in 2007, and we can see the sandy gravel. And these are the the, the boreholes that was done in 2016 after the earthquake. So we have a uh, 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 big uh, gravel and uh, small type of levels uh, in between of the matrix of uh, fan. So just to understand a little bit, this is the green side distribution. So on the on the uh, horizontal axis is the fan contribution, and uh, the vertical right axis is the gravel contribution, and the vertical. Uh, left axis is a fine. So you will see that it's mostly uh, gravelly sand and sandy gravel. So, and these uh, uh, lines with uh, green color are the, are the threshold that the chance consider uh, from zero to 30% if it's a, a, a sandy, uh, uh, a gravelly sandy material. Uh, uh, a gravelly sand material is going to behave as a sand, but between 30 to 70 percent, it's going to be a transition to 70 percent above. It's going to uh, behave as a gravel mm. uh, material. Okay, so uh, I'm going to show this uh, plot. This is a shear. Sea level velocity measurement uh, SB1 SK is the uh, stress stress uh, normalized gravel content corrected sea level velocity of the gravel sand. The SK came from a correction. Uh, I I use the the time to sixteen criteria. This is uh, presented in the AP uh, Geo Environmental and Geotechnical mm -hmm. Engineering uh, Journal. Uh, so uh, he, he, he considered uh, a correction for uh, gravel content. And uh, this is an equation that I'm presenting um, uh, using the D value that uh, considered the uh, intra uh, granular behavior of the uh, gravel soil metrics. Uh, so uh, we, I am I'm using D of 0.65. So I am showing here the low damage area, the sea wave velocity, uh, gravelly corrected stress normalized values, and the blue line is the, uh, the water table at the time of the earthquake. Uh, so you see uh, a value from 100 uh, to 130 meters per second. Uh, okay, so uh, this is a, uh, uh, sorry about that, it's very fast where the transitions, but uh, Chan also per, uh, presented a paper where he uh, uh, showed a uh, 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 testing for uh, uh, sands with a uh, amount of gravel from zero to 60%, and then gravel with the zero to 30% of uh, sand, and he uh, 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 select a threshold around 60% uh, 
where uh, 60 percent of uh, rubber content uh, uh, cannot uh, be uh, characterized as a sunlight source also the gravel uh, they uh, they after in, in 2015 to uh, show a threshold of 7 percent but the, the the response of the of the samples uh, that, that uh, he showed say that uh, could be due to the non uh, homogeneous uh, contact between the sand and uh, and the gravel. So uh, this is very uh, uh, interesting, such interesting that uh, uh, he did in, 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 in percent, and also I know that Dr. Ala Atamosopoulos Sekos from uh, Michigan is doing a very good job in, in this. And uh, you can see here uh, in this plot uh, where are the uh, manta ports, uh gravelly sand or sandy gravel material from uh, 35 to 65 uh, uh, a whole part of the uh, gravel content. I don't know how much time I, I have because of the, of the problem of the okay. case. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to show uh, what uh, uh, the, the, the flow chart in, uh, in chances of existing. So uh, we need to calculate the first, um, what is the, uh, the screenshot if the uh, rubber content from 50% to 70% uh, and uh, then it uh, says that we need to calculate the stress, uh, normalized uh, rubber content corrected shear rate velocity of the gravel uh, hand uh, material based on the gravel content. The the ball ratio yeah, could be uh, estimated based on the shear velocity measure. Uh, meant that we can use let's say a uh, main equation or Ishihara equation. So based on the uh, maximum shear models, we can calculate the ball ratio in situ ball ratio, and then we can uh, uh, calculate the shear uh, strength, uh, static shear strength, and he uh, consider a delta Vx uh, after it, that is a shifted uh, acceptor vector uh, shear wave velocity uh, that he determined by cell and, and error process uh, to move the lower bound of the case history. So we can see here the plot, this is the angles and stoky plot, and he uh, shift to the, to the left. Okay, and uh, so we did some uh, calculation from the CRR based on a deconvolution of the uh, strong motional record that we have, and then we did uh, a total stress uh, satisfaction analysis to capture the static uh, shear set and the CRR based on uh, uh, time methodology, and we can see the factor of safety less than one on the on the major song that is uh, where we we saw uh, the observation of uh, damage. So uh, the other thing is based on the shear velocity, and Chang uh, uh, also uh, so, sorry. Uh, 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 continue with the shear velocity. Uh, we we plot on the on the left the uh, Andrew and Stocky and just Marina uh, two uh, plot with uh, uh, PGA for steep soil and the shear velocity. And you will see the red the large damage and uh, low damage. So it's uh, likely to liquefaction uh, and also uh, liquefaction. Uh, okay. So it's, uh, it's uh, said that uh, uh, these uh, materials could uh, liquefy. And let's uh, move to the time plot. Uh, so it's a uh, VS1 SK value with a uh, blue dotted uh, value with uh, uh, CRR with, for VSK for fine content less than 80%. I can say that the fine content in this uh, uh, gravel is around 5%, no more than 20%. And with the red and, and blue, 
uh, uh, circles, you see our uh, data that uh, we saw with the market manifestation, and it's a little bit to the left for uh, 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 Chan plot, and definitely the Andrews and um, uh, Stocky is uh, very conservative uh, on the on the liquefaction uh, evaluation or uh, uh, or, or the uh, uh, circuit uh, shear strength uh, computation. So I think that uh, our data uh, fit very well with the uh, time 2016 data. Okay. We did also uh, the Chinese dynamic compensation based on Cow et al. Uh, this is a uh, 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 field case. <coughs> we, we create the, the, the cone similar from the uh, specification from Cow 2016, uh, 13, sorry, with this uh, 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 energy measurements. And you see here, we consider that. And uh, I will show uh, the, okay, you will see here the uh, instrumental rods. And this is the DPT values. I'm going to I'm going to show you basically the result. And uh, so this is where we saw this is uh, uh, based on the years report of uh, large damage and low damage. And uh, so, and you can see here, this is the probability of liquefaction based on cow uh, at all 250 method with N120. This is the dynamic compensation uh, values. And the CSR is the fatty shear stress ratio calculated from the total stress analysis. And we see the probability of liquefaction. And I put with red the 50% probability of liquefaction. And with low damage, we see there is a, uh, from 7 meters, from DPT 1P, is uh, no probability of liquefaction on the upper, upper part. And then the DPT 1, we have uh, some layers that are actually liquefied. And for last, damage uh, sites, DPT2, DPT3, DPT4, DPT4, uh, 4P, you see more uh, uh, soils, uh, gravelly, sandy, and subsidiary soils that, that the method uh, uh, evaluates uh, 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 estimate the probability of liquefaction of 100%. So I think that this method uh, captures what we found at the other side. Uh, finally, the conclusions. This is a very interesting uh, equit event of a magnitude 7.8 with a PGA at the side 0.46 to 0.52 that uh, increased the data from uh, liquefaction manifestation of uh, man-made gravelly sands or sandy gravel. Uh, we uh, observed it on uh, mass support and uh, is uh, recorded in the year 2016, 2016 uh, uh, report. This is a magnet level with uh, mostly 30% of 65% of uh, gravel content. And uh, we can say that the sugar velocity measure of one car to have a 13 and uh, can with a DPT method was uh, 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 okay and uh, in, uh, show similar trends that what we observe uh, at the field with uh, uh, damage that we, we saw at the uh, marginal uh, uh, work. Mm. Thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I know that uh, maybe there will be some questions. Thank you so much, Javier. Um, I think the questions will be responded um, after the event. I just wanted to uh, wrap this great event uh, thanking our gold sponsor, Harold Baker. Um, I also would like to thank uh, our committee chair for the Earthquake Engineering and Soil Dynamics Committee, uh, Adrian, um, who supported in, uh, me in putting this inaugural GIEFB event. 
hoping that we have many more in the future. I would also like to thank uh, Diane Swecker with ASCE and also uh, Nadia Cortez and her staff for helping us with uh, this uh, live streaming web conference. Uh, and finally, to thank the speakers and their collaborators for taking their time uh, to in putting this together. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to end this uh, great event, and I want to wish you a great rest of your day. Thank you. This does conclude today's webcast. You may disconnect at this time and have a great day.